Hey guys, welcome to my channel where we discuss anything and everything to do with mental health and psychology. In this video, we'll be going through part A of the KSA and that's awareness of risk. And in this video, the lighting will be off and you'll probably hear drilling work in the background. Unfortunately, I can't do anything about that and yeah, because these videos are not on a schedule and really random and I just record them when I can I didn't realise when I sat down that noise was there but as since I started recording someone decided to drill so hopefully you can still hear me and you know it doesn't affect the information being shared in this video but anyway let's just get straight into the video so as usual I recommend split screening this with a KSA guide that I'm going to link down in the description box and yeah and I'm going to be looking down because I've got my laptop here just to give you all the information that I have about this KSA. So within this part of the KSA what they're assessing for is your awareness of risk and your awareness and ability to be able to assess that risk. So awareness of clinical risk factors, the different types of risks and your ability to assess for them in clinical practice. To demonstrate this, you need to have a self-statement, a training course and a reference. So you need all of these and instead of a reference, you can do a um, countersigned self-statement. Okay, let's get into the self-statement. So I started off the self-statement with my generic experience of risk and the importance of being aware of risk. This went into my awareness of different types of risk and my knowledge about different types of risks. So this included risk to self, risk from others, and the risk to others. So when you're talking about risk um, in general, I would give specific examples of the risks, the type of risks that you've worked with. But you can use, just almost like reflect on your experiences and find, okay, when have I worked with risk to others? And I think clinical significant risk is important, like the common ones in mental health, which is abuse, which is self-harm, um, suicidal ideation or suicidal behaviour. Those kind of things are um, almost like the standard you need to be aware of them in mental health, but also talk about the other ones that are less mentioned. So compliance with medication or um, physical health risks, just showing that you know that um, mental and physical health you're, are not mutually exclusive and you're almost considering the whole of a person rather than just focusing on uh, or being aware of mental health risks if that makes sense. I spoke about awareness of vulnerability so people might not have mental capacity which might make them more vulnerable um, they might not have awareness they might be vulnerable in society to risk of abuse anyway so for example they let's say you think someone might be um, a potential risk for financial abuse that might be something that you highlight in case they're um, going to a supported living setting or even if they're living independently it's just something to be aware of and mindful of um, if that makes sense but obviously I provide context for why this thing is a risk if that makes sense in your examples I also explain how I developed my knowledge of risk from um, when I first started my journey within my psychology career to um, when I wrote my KSA and wrote how it was constantly developing and how I went into training and my awareness of the importance of constantly going into training. So some of the bigger ones in within the NHS is the self-harm awareness training, um, suicide risk awareness, um, mental health first aider, if you've had that kind of training. Um, there's risks specific to um, different disorders if that makes sense um, so just generally talking about how you've developed your training throughout the years and the different ways that you've collected that knowledge and awareness I also spoke about who is at risk and why and that links back to what I said about um, being aware of vulnerability so are there risk populations within mental health just having a mental health issue is um, increases your risk of um, abuse and neglect or um, abuse from others and in some cases with some disorders uh, abuse to others 
um, almost demonstrating your awareness of the different types of risks, how you develop that knowledge and your commitment to almost like learning and being aware of um, different types of risks because obviously um, knowledge of risk is always increasing for example um, I know a few years ago there was um, almost like an increase in knowledge about things like FGM um, or there was an increase in um, knowledge and there was a promotion of going on to prevent training so in that way you can highlight how you've been committed to training and learning about different types of risks because there's always going to be um, awareness and there's also going to always be um, different types of risks that you don't know about but it's up to us to be able to learn that and the most common ones um, almost emphasized throughout the last few years is FGM um, the prevent training which the two I've already mentioned um, human trafficking uh, modern slavery things like that that you really need to be aware of because they're current issues and then you can link this to maybe some populations being more at risk so considering beyond the risk or the vulnerability that being diagnosed with a mental health problem brings it's considering the individual as a whole and going beyond that to consider maybe specific risk factors for example um, being from certain countries might make you more at risk of certain um, exploitations or certain types of abuse than in other countries but then being aware of um, the signs and symptoms so when you're actually talking about the different types of risks talk about the signs and symptoms because that's demonstrating your knowledge does that make sense and if anything doesn't make sense please leave it down in the comments and I can elaborate further or someone else can elaborate further so once you've um, almost collated that knowledge as a whole it, that demonstrates your awareness but then now link it back to your practice so how has this informed your practice talk about a time where you have had training and then um, maybe been more aware of risk and how you dealt with that risk or how you learned something in your undergraduate and let's say specifically about risk and how that translated to your practice for example have you ever done a risk assessment have you ever taken someone out for section 17 leave or have you ever um, been aware of risk and noticed signs or symptoms in someone um, let's say anger or hostility or a type, different types of abuse and have you ever um, saw that and it led to them getting the help and the support they need did you did it lead to them getting safeguarded does that make sense so use those kind of examples and linking how your training or your education like almost informed your practice and link them together also if you haven't had um, therapy specific training or therapy like um, practice before also link this to why it could be important as a therapist um, for example guiding the assessment process guiding therapy generally just checking in with people safeguarding managing immediate risk um, so you're almost linking it back to okay I have this awareness I have used this in practice and I am aware of how it would apply to being a therapist and then talk about why these factors are important to consider why they are important to address particularly when you suspect abuse or you suspect um, some kind of neglect or um, harm towards themselves um, so you can um, being aware of it you can reduce the risk um, you can explore um, protective factors so if they are at risk from um, themselves exploring protective factors environmental factors that are contributing transitions family history personal history other factors other vulnerabilities are also important to consider like i mentioned um, certain ethnic groups or um, people from certain countries might be more at risk of certain types of abuse or neglect or present different risk factors for example so if we're thinking about let's I think it will be make more sense to think of a specific um, example and then like if we work through that together you can kind of think of one that you have experience of so if we think about self-harm or suicidal behaviors which is a common risk factor within mental health um, we can think about other vulnerabilities or other factors that contribute to that risk so it can increase the risk or it can reduce the risk so if we think about protective factors 
within self-harm and suicidal behaviours, protective factors are quite, like, very important to think about because you know that the more protective factors someone has, the more it protects them from harm from themselves. So you can think about environmental, so um, things within the environment that might increase or reduce their risk, um, transition periods which are known to be stressful, um, and a vulnerability period of at being at risk from yourself. Um, if you're self-harming or have suicidal behaviours, transitions are known to increase distress. Um, family history or personal history, so do they have uh, past experiences of, of self-harming or suicidal behaviours? Um, family history, does anyone else have mental health problems or does anyone else, um, has anyone else engaged in those kind of behaviours? And the thing is, it's really important to almost say, okay, it's important to be aware of the risk factors, but then um, the other external factors are also important to consider. So making it personal to the individual to be able to make risk or safety plans. Um, and then again, that's linking into why it's important to be aware of these, um, to almost like inform your practice or inform your assessment process or informing your risk management plan when you're a therapist. Unless you've got experience with that, talk about also your experience with that and how it's been useful within your practice to consider that. And when you're talking about knowledge and experience, what you can also talk about is were there any models that you know of related to that type of risk? For example, um, with self-harm and suicidal behaviours, there are models and there is an extensive amount of research into the process of what leads someone to engage in those kind of behaviours. So if you're aware of those, how being aware of those informed your practice and especially if you did like a clinical psychology or mental health um, training or mental health module, they mostly would have this kind of information in there, especially if you did a lecture on risk. So just have a look through maybe any materials you've got from your undergraduate or any other courses you've done and just try and refresh your memory on, okay, what did we go through and actually has that influenced my practice? Um, so I included what I learned from my clinical psychology module because we had a lecture on risk and we had a le lecture on uh, self-harm and suicidal behaviours. Um, so, and I spoke about what I learned from this and how it informed my practice, particularly um, after grad graduating and going straight into working in mental health and how um, there was almost, I also spoke about how there was almost like a difference between um, what you learn in a textbook about risk and what actually there is in practice because it's not as, um, and I think I've mentioned this in a previous video, it's not as clean cut as um, it would be in um, a textbook because in a textbook it's very specific like, oh, you do this, this and this and you explore these factors. But then in practice, you see a whole range of factors that you might not have learned about. And maybe if that's happened to you, maybe talk about that. Um, I also spoke about um, how there's an ethical and moral responsibility and a duty of care to respond to these factors and be aware of these factors. So you need to have knowledge. And I spoke, also spoke about why it's a duty of care and why it's important and how this is part of your role. So keeping on top of training, keeping on top of be your knowledge and skills in being able to assess risk and be aware of risk is part of your job and part of your duty of care and is a, it is a legal obligation too. Um, I also spoke about being aware of child protection laws, um, child protection um, policies, th things like that that you're aware of specific to your country that are um, legally binding. So it's not just an ethical and moral responsibility, it's a legal um, responsibility and being aware of that. Vulnerable adults, are there any laws protecting them? Um, and really emphasising here that you are aware of, sorry if I'm looking down, I'm just trying to like get all the points down. Um, really here being aware of and acknowledging your responsibility and really emphasising that. Um, so risk policy, safeguarding, knowing the processes of managing risk in different organisations and speak about why it's important and other things 
um, for example, day-to-day -day things like going to handovers, communicating risk and why it's important. So if you've had, um, let's say you've done a key working session with someone or you've had a conversation with a service user or a patient and they've communicated risk to you, how you manage that and why it was important for you to communicate. And maybe sometimes that, because for example, if you worked inpatient, the environment is so fast paced that you might miss information, right? Or you might, um, forget to communicate because of another risk arises straight away. And maybe the, because I spoke about this, how um, I had a key working session with someone and when I came out of that key working session, I was kind of thrown into another risk situation, which was an immediate risk. So then everything from my key working session, I didn't communicate and how I could have dealt with that situation better um, to be able to manage my um, risk. So if you take it to supervision, discuss it with supervi in supervision or you've discussed it with um, another staff member, let's say a senior nurse or nurse in charge and almost like reflecting on, okay, how could you have done things differently um, to also manage the immediate risk or um, and communicate at the same time. So you could have communicated uh, quickly with another staff member to take over one of them while you um, hand something over or um, you could have um, enabled that person in the immediate risk situation to be safe and then communicated straight away um, or recorded it while you were talking to the person. There's, it depends on really the situation. So really explain the context of the situation and what happened, what you did, what you learned from it, um, what you would do in the future and why this is important within your practice and why it would be important as a therapist. Um, and I know it's really hard for me to explain these without specific examples, but I really want to leave it open to you to be able to actually apply what I'm saying to a situation that um, maybe you're aware of or you know about. Um, so you can also sp speak about responsibility of others within your team, um, depending on what your role is, using supervision, using incident reports. So then I also spoke about confidentiality and why confidentiality is important, but then also why the breach clause of confidentiality is important for um, people to know and people to be informed. So if someone is communicating risk, confidentiality should be explained to them um, before they disclose the risk. Um, and when it's breached, you should also um, also support the individual, supporting the individual in telling them about the process, telling them you're going to breach and try and get consent to um, breach their confidentiality. Even though it's a legal obligation, it's always better to get consent um, in breaching confidentiality. And then also speak about how um, you supported them throughout the process. So even after, especially because if someone ex has disclosed risk, they, it took the, a lot for them to be able to disclose it to you. So talking about how you're gonna, you have supported them or why it's important, um, or and why it's important to be able to support them when they've disclosed risk and you're aware of almost the emotional process of someone disclosing something. Um, to you. So another point that I've also spoken about is being aware of the different levels of risks in different organisations and how they need different levels of interventions for those risks. Um, for example, inpatient might be very different to um, let's say IAPT or um, primary care services if that makes sense. So you might want to refer to maybe different settings you've worked in or compare different settings that you've worked in and how their policies and procedures were a lot different. So within this, I'd also go into the assessment process, that you're aware of the assessment process and the assessing of different types of risks. Um, if you have experience with this, then great, then mention the experience you have with this. But in most pre-qualification, um, almost like, like, you know what the core, core professions, you don't really assess as much risk. So, um, I will talk about the assessment process and how you're aware of the difference between thinking and acting. So if we use it again, the um, risk of um, suicidal ideation or um, self-harm and suicidal behaviours, um, 
and this applies to both the difference between thinking and acting so you're aware that suicidal ideation is not the same as acting on your suicidal thoughts and how there's different levels and different processes um, so there's difference between thinking and acting um, so the difference between ideation intent plan and means so if you've just because you're thinking about um, not wanting to be here it doesn't mean that you're going to act on your thoughts about not wanting to be here so there's almost like okay you need to assess the ideation what are the thoughts saying what are they about what's the common theme and how frequent they are um, the intent um, how likely is the person to be able to act on the thoughts um, the plan do they have a plan and how what is the extent of the plan so have they gone all the way to they know the date they're going to do it what method they're going to use things like that um, because if someone has like a vague plan um, and this is not in all cases this is where you need to be aware of the individual but if they have a vague plan it's less likely that they act on their plan but if they have a very specific plan the more likely it is but again this is like almost a generic um like i don't want to call it a stereotype but it's almost like um in most cases this happens but you need to be very aware of the individual so then relate back to like almost like the therapeutic relationship why that's important particularly if you're breaching confidentiality because in this case if someone says they have a plan and they're thinking about it um in some cases when they're thinking about it you need to breach confidentiality for example if you're in primary care and someone says um they're suicidal you might need to breach confidentiality um to be able to um get them the services and the help they need um if it's something that's a prolonged thing and the reason they were referred to you was due to their suicidal ideation if there's no change you would still need to almost like communicate and have support and obviously tell them beforehand that any um risk to themselves or others you would have to breach confidentiality but it might not be something that you need to directly tell everyone if that's almost like a um entry requirement for your service that you work in because i don't because there's so many services that i don't know what your specific services or the experience that you have what kind of services it's in um but like ideation intent plan means all need to be communicated um and then the also highlighting um and being aware that risk is actually dynamic so it's not a static thing where if someone's um for example has suicidal ideation they'll always have suicidal ideation or if someone has never expressed a thought that doesn't mean they're never gonna have them does that make sense so it's something that's um dynamic and constantly changing so then you need to be aware that it's dynamic and constantly changing so then you need to um get into the habit of regularly checking in um so the importance of continually checking um risk um you might want to also talk about other means of assessing risk so for example if you work in iapt um you have the phq9 um and then question i believe it's question nine on there assess risk so it talks about how likely are you no it talks about i can't remember the exact question i'll put it on the screen somewhere um but it's basically asking you um about your um your harm to yourself basically and you rate it out of three um so have you got experience with any of those kind of measures that measure um almost like alternative to assessing so when you're seeing someone quite regularly okay um you're aware of okay i need to pay particular attention to this question but within your check-ins you would um regularly check in with that anyway um the importance of creating safety plans care plans things like that just anything that you've had input in so if you're let's say for example an assistant psychologist and you've sat in on um or aided towards care plans or helped um write care plans because in some services um assistant psychologists can write care plans um obviously being um oversighted by someone who has a professional registration um things like that if you have the, any of that kind of experience you've worked with someone one-to-one -one, or you've been involved in some kind of care plan making safety planning talk about that how the process was the types of questions you asked 
the methods or how you wrote it up, how you got to know the individual, you based it on the therapeutic relationship. And that also brings me in to my next point, which is you need to, and I know I say is you need to talk about and it's important to talk about, but obviously, as I've said in all these videos, this is just giving you insight and support in um, giving you ideas of what to write, potentially write about. Obviously, any of this, if you don't want to write about it, don't write about it. If you don't have experience in it, then they, you can show that you have knowledge of it. You don't have to write about it. Or if you have points that I've not made and you think that could be important or it could be um, something that your personal statement would benefit from, then just put it in. Um, so I don't have all the answers. Um, so yeah, but just my um, next point is that um, when talking about um, all of these, I would end, well, I ended mine with talking about how awareness is important, knowledge is important, training is important, education about different types of risks is, is important, knowing how to assess is important, but then I tied it together with talking about important characteristics within a person to be able to manage risk. And then within this, I spoke about openness, um, confidence in talking about difficult topics and openness and confidence in being able to have a very open and honest dialogue, um, especially with, um, let's say, telling them about confidentiality or if they do um, disclose risk and knowing how to handle that. Um, so not acting with shock, um, having no judgment, having compassion, empathy, and because even if it's risk to others, um, if it's, for example, violence and aggression, knowing that violence and aggression comes from somewhere, um, but then also keep in mind that you have a moral and ethical duty to safeguard other people too. Um, so if they're telling you that they're, I don't know, abusing someone, then it's important for you to safeguard that person too. Um, even though the person in front of you is your um, client and your patient, um, knowing that you have um, a moral obligation to, and a legal obligation to report crimes that happen. Um, if it's something like aggression towards you and hostile behaviour towards you or someone else, you're going to talk about that safeguarding, you're going to talk about how you have a moral and legal obligation to safeguard others, even if they're not in the room. Um, but you're also going to talk about how Let's say you're working in forensic services or you're working some other kind of service. What are they trying to communicate through their aggression? Because if you see aggression as an iceberg, there's a lot more happening underneath that's beyond the aggression that maybe they don't know how to communicate um, or needs that they have don't have met. So even within that, showing that you have compassionate understanding, even if it's towards you or someone else. Does that make sense? Um, but if someone's at immediate risk, your priority is at immediate risk. So knowing the different levels of risk is also important. So you can um, talk about how you, within risk, that you know about how to manage emotive environments. And what you'll see from a lot of psychology jobs is that a lot of them are do talk about oh, being able to handle emotive environments. Um, talking about um, trust, listening, empathy, and actually taking listening a lot further and talking about active listening, talking about, you know, the difference between empathy and sympathy, for example, talking about how important trust is and then linking that to even confidentiality breaches where you, when you breach confidentiality, it does rupture some therapeutic relationships, but knowing that you have the ability and the skills to be able to um, mend that after it happens. So supporting the person, explaining in detail and as much as possible um, what you're going to do. But obviously this depends on different types of risks. Um, and talking about the importance of the therapeutic relationship and being able to contain that risk and contain um, the emotions that come with it. 
um, is also really important. So yeah, that's it for the video guys. Um, hopefully you found this video useful and it helps you in writing the eighth section of the KSA. Um, if you have any com comments, questions or concerns, please leave them down in the comments and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. Alternatively, I'll, I've also made a TikTok um, with the same name as a channel, um, Sid the Therapist. Currently don't have any videos on there yet, but if you would rather me make a video form of any of the questions you have that don't really need a YouTube video dedicated to it, then um, yeah, head over to TikTok and if you um, have a question, I'll most likely answer it as soon as you, um, as soon as I see it because I'm on, I'm on TikTok all the time. Um, yeah, but yeah, like, comment, share, subscribe if you haven't already. Um, and if you notice, my videos also have ads now, but um, I'm not monetized. So if you want to subscribe, please go ahead. It will be very useful. Um, so I can actually um, get paid for the ads that go onto my videos. But yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, see you guys in the next video.